Hello everyone and welcome back. In, in this episode, we're going to begin our study of comparative economic development. We're going to do so by looking at classifications of national development levels through the lens of average income. As we're going to see, this is very limited as a way of comparing countries, but it's the most standard way. And it's very important to understand it in part to be able to see the advantages of supplementing it with other approaches. So we begin with how the developing world is defined in terms of income per capita. The World Bank's framework is the standard one most widely used. World Bank ranks countries based upon their gross national income per capita, income being the standard of living indicator, and they're looking here at the average incomes. Accordingly, with income thresholds, they define the low-income countries, lower middle income countries, upper middle income countries, and then two kinds of high income countries, high income OECD countries, which tend to be the countries we think of as the developed, industrialized, rich world, and so on, and other high income countries. There are many other high income countries in part because the threshold that the World Bank sets for moving from an upper middle income country to an um, high income country is just a little over $12,000, so not really very high in the global scheme of things. So then it may be useful, I'm going to suggest it from time to time, that we think about very high income countries as another classification. To some extent, it's an analog with the human development index, a very high human development level, which we'll see in the following episode. Um, but these could be countries with incomes per capita over around $40,000 per year. It's at this threshold that you see countries that have mastered the range of technologies and the skills associated with them across the different sectors in a way that you may not see in countries that have just crossed the line. So in any case, this is the World Bank schema with a, a um, um, what I think is a useful um, footnote and way to think further about it. And so gross national income is used for purposes of living standards. One could also use, in some cases, gross domestic product. The World Bank used to do so. It does not now. Gross domestic product is particularly useful in looking at productivity differences, which is closely associated with resulting income. But as we know from Econ 12 and so on, there's some distinctions between national income and um, domestic product, depending on trade. And we go one further step later on, it's very important, looking at the purchasing power parity method instead of exchange rates in order to convert the value of currencies from, the, from other currencies to the dollar in particular. So we're going to come back to that um, in just a little bit. So then, according to these classifications, you can get a sense of distribution of development levels defined in this way across the world. And so I point your attention to Table 2.1 in the text. We're not going to read this very small print. Um, you can look at it later. I, I think it's uh, pages 38 and 39 in the textbook in Chapter 2. It is of interest for a couple of um, reasons. Um, an important one is that this is where you will primarily find your choice countries for the written assignment for the semester, because this is describing those low and middle income countries um, by, by name. And for convenience, I think from the point of view of finding countries that you might like to work with, it's divided by geographic region and alphabetical within geographic region, East Asia, Pacific, Europe, Central Asia, Latin America, Middle East, North Africa, South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. And in each case, you get the three-digit country code in letters that can help you identify countries on certain graphs and maps that you'll discover in which instead of a dot for each country, sometimes there'll be three letters instead of a dot to, so you can identify the country. That's sometimes too messy when the dots are too close together. Um, and um, an indication of the country's level, LIC for low income country and so on. Then we have the high income OECD countries, Australia, Austria, and so on, down through 
the UK and the US. Then we have a substantial additional list of um, countries that are considered other high income countries. And so um, they may include countries such as Argentina, which have crossed the line into high income status, but may, with about $12,000 of income, still be just considered um, in the developing countries group for a variety of reasons. So you can choose some of these countries as well. I've just seen a country, one country is out of place, but nonetheless. Right, so then this corresponds to what you see on the map. And so this may not come as a big surprise. You find the high income OECD countries in North America, in Western Europe, and along the Pacific Rim and beyond, namely Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. That is, for the most part, the high-income developed OECD world. And then there are, as I mentioned, various countries that are also high-income. Saudi Arabia kind of pops out, it's in the center of the map in red, but it's an example of a high-income country um, which, as most of us know, is an oil exporting country, very reliant on one um, um, natural resource export product, and is viewed by many, including in Saudi Arabia, as still having significant development problems that they're facing. So from there, we turn to the upper middle income economies, and we see that they are predominantly found in Latin America, and in Northern and Eastern Asia. Some exceptions in Latin America, there are some lower middle income countries, Haiti's a low income country, but this is a broad pattern. And Russia and China are examples, also Thailand, um, of countries that are in the upper middle income range. Then in the lower middle income range, these are Predominantly, some of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, many others are low-income countries. South Asia and Southeast Asia, where we most commonly find these countries. Um, movement up this um, categories of countries is uh, striking, as many countries have moved over the years from low-income to lower-middle-income status. And I'll point to Bangladesh, a country that just about four years ago, I'd have to go back and check exactly, um, moved um, from low income to, to uh, lower middle income status, which was a cause of great celebration in the country, and deservedly so, when they won their independence in, uh, I think it was 1971. Um, they were the second poorest country in the world. Um, however, we have other countries that remain in low income country status. These are predominantly, but not only, found in Sub-Saharan Africa. A few other very important examples. Afghanistan is an example. For, um, and so you'll see some other such cases. I already mentioned that Haiti was a case. Nepal is another example, and so on. And so this gives you something of a broad overview of what this looks like globally as a starting point. And so using those uh, data, we can compare countries in their incomes per capita. So here we have annual gross national income per capita in 2018 US dollars. And here we have a variety of countries. Now these are not randomly selected. These countries are selected um, um, often in these um, tables um, so that you can compare them with countries that are in the case studies at the end of the chapters and the findings boxes, the various other empirical results and illustrations described, or though sometimes just because it's an important country. So in this range of countries, you are finding, if you look at the numbers, countries between you know, $400-ish per person per year and $4,000-ish um, per capita per person per year. And in contrast, for our illustrative high-income OECD countries, we have incomes that are just a little over $40,000 per person per year, and in, although in the US case, $58,000 per person per year. And so we're talking about orders of magnitude of countries like Canada having 100 times 
the income per person of the Democratic Republic of Congo and um, 10 times um, the income of countries such as in the, in the Ghana to, to, towards Egypt range. So these are truly dramatic numbers. Um, and remember, when we talk about 100 times greater, it's not 100% greater, it's not double, it's 100 times greater. And so in some cases, um, even more than 100 times with the, the US at 60,000 and some other countries significantly higher than that, such as uh, Luxembourg, which has, well, not many people and a lot of banks. In any case, um, this is unbelievable, in part in the sense that it's not just striking, but it does not adjust for purchasing power parity. If we do adjust for the fact that cost of living is lower in low-income countries because the cost of services is much lower, if we allow for that, then the differences is much the, the differences are much smaller, um, maybe a third as much, which uh, or at least um, something on that order. We'll give you some examples: two and a half times as much. So, in other words, uh, for example, um, rather than having 120 times. Uh, greater income, you would find uh, 40 or 50 times greater income. So, but it makes a very significant difference nonetheless. And so usually we cover purchasing power parity in Econ 12. I'll have relatively little to say about um, how we get to it in this class. However, I will ask you to think about, for starters, a simplified version of what's done in practice. This simplified version happens to be what the World Bank used to do, um, and it's, a, it's an approximation, but only an approximation, and I will tell you why. But the approximation, which is represented in this algebra, this is what you would tell a computer to do with, your, with all the data in the, in the world at your disposal to do it once, but with this algebra, we're getting at something very simple, namely, imagine that even though services are very cheap in Bangladesh, we're going to put US dollars, the cost of getting those same services within the United States in US dollars associated with the actual goods and services in Bangladesh. And so that to the extent that these goods and services are cheaper in Bangladesh, primarily because labor costs are lower we're adjusting for that and not making Bangladesh look more poor than it already is. So here we have the expenditure in the different countries for item I in country J. So for example, item I, just to think of an example I've, I've never used before, delivery of lunch and tea, or it could be some other, other beverage besides tea. It happens to be pretty common in Bangladesh. Country J will call, the particular country J will assign to the case of Bangladesh. Our comparative country will be the US. So we'll see J as, just pretend that's just Bangladesh and US is the United States. And so this tells you the expenditure in Bangladesh of each good and service. Perhaps one of them is delivery of lunch. And so from there, we want to be able to convert to a common exchange rate. So we have the international relative price for each item J, such as delivery of lunch. And it's relative to the United States by convention. It could be to some other currency, such as the British pound. But by convention, it's done with the US dollar. Um, and so that the international relative price for any um, item rel is going to be the um, price, for example, in Bangladesh of this item over the price um, in the US. And so this J is apparently a typo. That should be an I, item I, such as the lunch, right? So we're looking at the relative price for, for this delivery of lunch. So then we divide one by two, and in doing so, we get the value in Bangladesh at US prices. So in other words, it's the expenditure in Bangladesh on that particular item, delivery of lunch, divided by this relative price. So we make that adjustment. And um, as you can see, the PIJs cancel. So we have this QIJ back here, 
times the US price of that same service delivery of the lunch. We do this for all goods, then we, we add up the value in the country across the, gift, the, the uh, different goods, and we end up with the purchasing power parity adjusted income, and then income per capita divided by the number of people. And so this gives a better idea of real living standards in the country, which, you know, as we've been talking about and will continue to do, are what really matters in thinking about development levels. So um, just to conclude, I'm going to point your attention to the text, I think it's table 2.2, should be, um, in which there's a comparison across a number of countries between their exchange rate derived income per capita level and purchasing power parity. And finally, that's just the first on the list, and so that's one reason why I chose it. But their exchange rate we saw before is about 1470 um, income per capita dollars. But at purchasing power parity, it's a little over $4,000, um, so a little more than two and a half times um, higher. So the country remains low income, actually lower middle income from the point of view of someone living in the United States, but it shows that actual living standards on average are not as bad there as they might otherwise look once we take this into account. So I'm just going to conclude there and just mention that what we do next, we're going to look at an indicator of the development level that also takes health and education into account along with income to get a more comprehensive or well-rounded, if you want, view of development levels. That's the Human Development um, Index, which is our next uh, episode.